I'm speaking today with Dr. Ahmed Kasseb, professor in the Department of Gastrointestinal Medical Oncology, Division of Cancer Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Kasseb is leading a new clinical trial for patients with fibrolamellar cancer. And he's doing that with Dr. Sun Young Lee, his associate who's actually serving as principal investigator for this trial. Dr. Kasseb, could you just take a moment and remind people what a clinical trial actually is? Of course. So when we talk about you know, clinical trials, it's basically, um, um, in a sense, a monitored setting. So we try to treat our patients in a monitored setting where we um, um, limit the trial patients to those patients with preserved organ functions uh, because we uh, want to make sure that it is safe for them. And we put a lot of railings and uh, um, criteria to ensure that we are not introducing harm to them. Uh, so our clinical trial is combining um, three drugs. Two of them uh, are chemotherapy drugs, uh, five fluorouracil, and the other one is interferon. And the third drug is nivolumab, which is basically immunotherapy drug. And our study uh, starts out with two of them, 5-fluorouracil and interferon for eight weeks. So we get a biopsy, do these two drugs, and get another biopsy to show that these two drugs together um, will prime the tumor microenvironment and prepare the tumors for the effect of the immunotherapy. And that's based on our own trials um, and own um, data before that showed that these two drugs can actually um, enhance uh, the immune profiling of those tumors and increase immune infiltration of the tumor by uh, T lymphocytes, which will give immunotherapy a better chance to work uh, with these two chemotherapy drugs once we add it. So that's why it's kind of, you know, a stage design, eight weeks of chemotherapy alone, followed by adding immunotherapy. So we call it trial because it's a monitored setting and we um, record everything while patients are on it to make sure that we are not introducing harm to them and to make sure that we are learning um, and getting the best out of it. So that way, if we end up um, necessitating to down dose these drugs, for example, to make it more tolerable, we do that. Uh, so before application of the um, drug regimen uh, as standard of care, we have to do it in a clinical trial setting to make sure it is safe and it has a signal of activity. Dr. Kassab, your group at MD Anderson already has had considerable experience working with the first two drugs you mentioned, 5-fluorouracil and interferon together in fibrolamellar cancer patients. Could you tell us a little more about the specific rationale for adding the third drug, uh, an immune checkpoint inhibitor, and maybe talk a little bit about what those drugs do and why there's so much excitement about them? Sure. So the story started um, almost uh, 20 years ago, actually, was a study with 5 fluorouracil and interferon. And the study was actually initiated for conventional, you know, hepatocellular carcinoma. And then eventually eight patients made it to this study on that protocol. So overall, the, uh, the study was not a positive study because a lot of the conventional hepatocellular carcinoma patients had um, poor liver reserve and underlying liver disease, and they could not handle the uh, two drug regimen very well. However, fibrolamellar patients tolerated the best. And also we found um, two cases of complete response and uh, additional cases of partial response. So out of that experience, we started to use this regimen as our go-to regimen for uh, fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma patients. And then eventually we published our experience um, around um, 2012 with uh, 45 patients treated with this regimen to really share um, the, this um, information with uh, other investigators and patients and showed that uh, we are experiencing uh, nice responders on this regimen, uh, which enabled a, a number of patients to eventually go for surgery. And then when we were doing um, more sophisticated analysis with our uh, immunology, uh, immunology lab at MD Anderson in collaboration with Dr. James Allison, which is the Nobel laureate, um, uh, for medicine uh, two years ago, we, um, we encountered uh, this effect 
uh, that actually when we do five fluorouracil interferon and at the time of surgery, we check the immune um, cells, we found out that the immune cells um, had increased um, after in, uh, chemotherapy with 5 fluorouracil interferon, which has been inconsistent in other cancers as well, that chemotherapy, uh, when you do it, you induce some cell death in the tumor cells and the release of the antigens from those cells will actually recruit immune cells to the microenvironment. And then based on anecdotal data coming from other centers with single agent immunotherapy being not very promising, it was of course, you know, retrospective and some case reports. However, the data from other centers that showed that there is really no great benefit with immunotherapy alone. Uh, and that's because immune cells are not very um, um, uh, dense in the microenvironment. Uh, the whole hypothesis formulated uh, uh, in our mind to start with uh, chemotherapy and we experience what we had experienced before, which is increase in the T lymphocyte infiltration of the tumors. That's why we get those biopsies. So for our patients who are listening and are uh, concerned about obtaining two biopsies, uh, one before treatment and one after eight weeks, it's for this very specific reason that we want to really make sure we validate these results and show that uh, these two drugs are um, doing that to all patients. Uh, the immune cells are increasing in the microenvironment. And after the eight weeks, we add immunotherapy to these two drugs. So the study is going to be designed in a way um, to give us conclusive data in the end. Um, did we really increase the T lymphocytes uh, as expected? Number one. Number two, did that uh, make the immune, uh, the, uh, immune cells and the tumor cells uh, more prone to the effect of immunotherapy or not? So we really want to make sure that our overall overarching goal is to reach cure for those patients. So we start with the chemotherapy and then add immunotherapy. And every three months we get a scan and have our patients meet with our surgery team to see if there is a room for surgery. There are several types of immunotherapy which have already begun to be employed clinically with some success. Are, was hoping you could tell us a little more about the particular class known as immune checkpoint inhibitors that were introduced by Dr. Allison, your colleague, and Dr. Hanjo in Japan, and for which, as you said, they won the Nobel Prize in 2018. Could you tell us a little more about what a checkpoint inhibitor aims to do and how it fits with the other drugs in this trial at the more mechanistic level? Sure. So in a nutshell, uh, the whole story uh, is as follows. Immune cells in the microenvironment of the tumors are one of the defense mechanisms that our body um, uh, enacts whenever we get um, some cancer cells. The same thing happens, for example, with infection. So we call them tumor-specific immune cells or in case of viral infection, for example, virus-specific T cells. However, in terms of cancer cells, they are trying to survive as well. So they turn off the immune cells. And that's why those uh, checkpoint inhibitors are designed to activate immune cells and um, unleash you know, immune cells against the tumors. So the tumors are trying to survive and one of their defense mechanisms is to turn off those immune cells and those immunotherapy drugs, specifically checkpoint inhibitors, uh, work uh, to reverse this kind of uh, resistance. So this mechanism is very appealing. However, we really have to have enough immune cells in the microenvironment for, for immunotherapy to work. That's why we thought that immunotherapy single agent drugs alone did not really help our fibrolamellar patients very much because um, uh, if you look at the microenvironment in our immune um, microenvironment in our fibrolamellar tumors who are treated naive, uh, the infiltration of the immune cells is minimal. It's called cold environment. Um, however, with our strategy starting out with uh, chemotherapy, we're hoping that we turn it into a hot microenvironment, meaning that we um, recruit immune cells to the microenvironment and then activate them. So in that case, we would be ready for immunotherapy. So that's why we start with two chemotherapy drugs, and then we add uh, nivolumab 
and continue with the chemotherapy drug. So that's why our study is the first of its kind looking into this regimen in a sequential manner, not starting all of them together, but starting with chemotherapy upfront and then building up on it after the immune microenvironment uh, becomes more primed for immunotherapy. The use of the three drugs um, split as you've described allows you to answer some questions in a clinical trial that would not be done in standard practice perhaps. And I think you're aware and, and you yourself have some experience with this three drug therapy um, in patients, but what is it specifically that you hope to be able to learn in the clinical trial with the use of biopsies and so forth that can't be learned simply from clinical treatment alone? So that's, uh, that's an excellent question, Mark. And I would say, you know, that um, in general, the clinical trial setting with serial biopsies, we call it that way because we do one at baseline before any treatment and then untreatment biopsies are really the best way of dissecting the mechanism and validating our hypothesis. So the main difference between doing that and doing, you know, the three drug regimen together in a clinical practice is, number one, we don't know what's the immune profile for uh, our patients before treatment, because, you know, the standard of care is not to obtain, you know, biopsy uh, if they already have had the diagnosis done before. And number two is, we don't know if starting all of them together is um, superior or inferior to starting them sequentially. So Dr. James Allison and his team are on board with us and they're actually collaborating with us to do the immune profiling for all of our patients. So those 15 patients are gonna be all analyzed at Dr. Allison's lab to look at the immune profile before and after. And then after we add uh, nivolumab to the regimen, we will be getting serial scans to uh, confirm our hypothesis that you know adding the nivolumab uh, led to um, um, a significant um, improvement in tumor control, and we are hoping that we can get enough patients with tumor shrinkage that can enable surgery. So that's why we want to do it in a clinical trial fashion. Number one, to um, look at the immune profiling meticulously before treatment and on treatment after eight weeks. Number two, to make sure that we monitor our patients very closely and monitor their uh, rate of adverse events and their tolerance to make sure that if we are going to recommend that in future, uh, we will know the safe dose to do so and we will know what to expect from this small study to enable us to design the next large uh, larger study uh, before um, uh, applying this as a standard of care regimen. For patients who would like to participate in this clinical trial and help to contribute to better understanding of the cancer, as well as potentially to benefit from the treatment, could you tell us who are eligible for the trial? What patients are eligible to participate? Right. So uh, basically, uh, patients with confirmed fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma, so patients um, with known disease, number one, patients who are not surgical upfront. So our patient population, if those patients with unresectable fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma, so this is the definition based on the tumor parameters. Number two, based on their clinical condition, we want to be able to um, enroll patients with a good um, overall performance status and nutritional status. Uh, so patients who are up and about, patients who are uh, not symptomatic um, enough to a point where they are bedridden, for example, because it's gonna be too much on them. And then going more granular to the organ functions, we also have some parameters to make sure that they have sufficient blood count, for example. So those patients with severe anemia, um, not correctable or you know poor liver functions and they have jaundice in their eyes, these patients are going to be at risk for more complications related to therapy. So we have some generous criteria. It, it, it is not like we have to have um, class A in every single number, but we have some criteria to make sure that um, their chances of tolerating the treatment is, is, is very good. So that way we make sure we're not introducing harm to them and their body and their organs. Can patients participating in the trial 
be treated only at the MD Anderson Cancer Center, or can they also be treated at their at centers perhaps closer to their homes? Uh, good question, and we always get asked that question. Uh, at this stage, you know, for our study purpose, we want to be able to evaluate them in person, and it's going to be every two weeks visit. We will um, do that at MD Anderson for one main reason, just to make sure we're capturing everything um, in our database. I, I would imagine down the line that our um, uh, collaboration with other centers will enable us to open the studies at multiple sites in the US. So that way, every single patient in the US could have a closer center to them. Also down the line, we're hopeful that at least the um, chemotherapy part um, uh, in the beginning could be administered locally. Thank you so much. Um, how can patients, caregivers, other physicians, and others who are interested get more information about this study and particularly about how to potentially enroll in the study? So um, there are different routes. So one of them is uh, in the Anderson, our website, and there is um, a clinical trial page and they can find it under liver cancer studies. Also, it will be posted on clinicaltrials.gov, both websites will have our research nurse coordinator um, contact information. Uh, I'm also um, trying to post my contact information um, to the same websites and hopefully through your Fabrula Miller Foundation website as well. Thank you very much for explaining the importance of clinical trial participation and for this trial in particular and best wishes to you and the patients who enter. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, I, I have to say that, you know, it wouldn't have been possible to open this study without the Fabio Miller Foundation. It was based on a generous grant from the foundation and our team at Anderson really appreciated that on behalf of our patients and our uh, clinical trial team.